all lucky to have him as the Solicitor General of our, of our country, and we're also lucky to host him here in Ohio this afternoon. So please join me in welcoming Noel Francisco to the stage. Ben, thanks for that uh, introduction. I always chuckle a little bit when I hear somebody run through my resume because in, in my view, the, the, the key thing for my career was my clerkship for Justice Scalia. And you know, getting a clerkship like that is really a fantastic thing, but there are a lot of people that get their clerkships because they've got great law school grades or uh, something like that. I got mine in a slightly different way. Back when I was clerking for Judge Ludig, Judge Ludig was actually the uh, first law clerk to Justice Scalia when Justice Scalia was on the DC Circuit. And so Justice Scalia had almost an unwritten rule that he would take one looted clerk each year. So I arrived at Chambers not sure whether I would be able to get a clerkship, but lo and behold, my two co-clerks had managed to secure clerkships with Justices O'Connor and Rehnquist already. So Justice Scalia had no choice at that point but, but, but to take me for the job. So, uh, so that's why I laugh a little bit whenever I hear somebody run through that. Ben, thanks for that introduction. Uh, I'm honored to address the Federal Society's annual Ohio Lawyers Chapters Conference. It's always a pleasure to be with fellow members of the Federal Society, and it's always a pleasure to get out of Washington, D.C. for a day. It's fitting that your conference is here in Columbus, home to the two newest judges on the Sixth Circuit, Chad Riedler and Eric Murphy. Chad is a good friend of mine and a law partner at Jones Day and was an outstanding colleague at the Department of Justice. Uh, Eric was also a colleague at Jones Day and he was a terrific Solicitor General of Ohio, as I know firsthand from arguing alongside of him uh, just last year in a voting rights case. We won it, by the way, five to four in an opinion written by Justice Alito uh, reaffirming one of Ohio's voting rights laws. Uh, they sit here in Columbus with Judge Sutton, one of the finest appellate, law, appellate judges in the country, and also a former Jones Day alum and also a former uh, Justice Scalia clerk alum. And not too far away, of course, is Judge Batchelder. Uh, Judge Batchelder, I don't know where you are. Unfortunately, you aren't a Jones Day alum, but you have had a distinguished career on the Sixth Circuit bench, and it's really an honor to be with you here today. Uh, it's also great to be with lawyers here in the heartland of America. Columbus, Cincinnati, Toledo, and Cleveland. Cleveland, of course, is where Justice Scalia started his career uh, when he practiced at Jones Day about a half century ago, and I know he treasured his time there. He was once asked at, law, at a law school event what advice he would give to young lawyers, and his response was this, try to find a practice that enables you to maintain a human existence, time for your family, your church or synagogue, community, Boy Scouts and Little League. You should look for a place like that. And he added, I'm sure they're still out there. Maybe you have to go to Cleveland. <laughs> for better or worse, that's one piece of advice from the justice that I've not been able to follow. I've spent my legal career in Washington, D.C., and for the past two years have had the honor of serving as Solicitor General of the United States. So what I thought I'd do this afternoon is share a few thoughts today about that experience but then focus for longer than I usually do in speeches on an issue of substance and one that I think should concern us all as lawyers and citizens, and that is the proliferation of nationwide injunctions in our federal courts. So let's start out with the Solicitor General's Office. Congress created the Solicitor General's Office in 1870, at the same time that it created the Department of Justice. President Ulysses Grant, also an Ohio native, appointed the first Solicitor General, Benjamin Bristow, a former U.S. attorney in Kentucky who earned his reputation fighting the Ku Klux Klan after the Civil War. Other early occupants of the office included legal titans like William Howard Taft, another Ohio native, uh, Charles Evans Hughes, and Robert Jackson, who many consider to be one of the best writers ever to sit on the Supreme Court, a position he held uh, some years after serving as Solicitor General. More recently, uh, Solicitor Generals have included some of the most talented lawyers that I've had the opportunity to argue alongside of or before. 
including the likes of Ted Olson, Paul Clement, and Elena Kagan. So those are big shoes to fill, and it's something that I uh, keep in mind and work hard to do every day, living up to their example. The statute that President Grant signed back in 1870 directs that the Solicitor General should argue cases before the Supreme Court that, quote, in which the United States is interested. And that's still the core of the job. The court hears about 65 to 70 cases a year. The government participates as a party in about two dozen of those cases, and as an amicus, uh, and as amicus in another two dozen or so. And that basically means we participate in two-thirds to 75 percent of all of the merits cases that are argued before the Supreme Court each term. Uh, the job also have, has some less visible aspects to it. By Department of Justice regulations, the Solicitor General authorizes any government appeal, any petition for rehearing in bank, the filing of an amicus brief, or any intervention to defend the constitutionality of federal laws in other courts. We receive uh, over 2,000 of those types of requests every year. We also file a fair number of Supreme Court briefs at the certiorari stage, including invitation briefs where the court asks for the Solicitor General's views. They're called uh, CVSG, or Call for the Views of the Solicitor General. Uh, Judge Sutton, you may remember that during our time clerking, Chief Justice Rehnquist used to call a CVSG Call for the Views of Another Law Clerk. So that, that may give you some insight into what the justices think about the colloquial reference to the Solicitor General as the quote unquote 10th justice, something I've never heard a justice actually use. <laughs> I also spend a fair amount of time on cases that are not in the Supreme Court but that are, that are significant for other reasons. As you may have noticed, this administration has been sued a few times in the last couple of years. The Solicitor General is the senior most litigator in the department, so I get involved early in some of the more high-profile cases to help set litigation strategy, and I had the great honor of working with Judge Riedler doing that for a couple of years. As I'll discuss in more detail later on, that sometimes involves asking the Supreme Court for emergency relief from lower court orders. As those of you who follow the Supreme Court know, this has been a fascinating time to practice before the court. Last term was something that could, by any objective measure, be called a blockbuster term. <laughs> Among the many important decisions the court decided uh, were its decisions upholding the president's travel executive order, uh, overruling a 40-year-old precedent to hold that mandatory public sector agency fees unlawfully compelled public employee speech, and a decision, of course, vacating Colorado's application of its public accommodations law to a Christian baker who declined to bake a wedding cake for a same-sex wedding. This more recent term has produced fewer headlines, but there are still quite a number of important cases on the docket. Among the other questions this term, the court will decide, as we've just heard about, uh, whether or not uh, political gerrymandering is justiciable, whether key portions of the federal sex registry statute violate the non-delegation doctrine, whether to overrule Seminole Rock and our deference, an important administrative law doctrine, whether a 93-year-old Latin Cross World War I memorial uh, sitting in Bladensburg, Maryland violates the Establishment Clause, and uh, the case I'll argue later this month and my last for this term, whether the 2020 census can include a question about citizenship. It's often said that the whole court changes when a new justice joins, and there's some truth to that. Justices Scalia and Kennedy were on the court for a combined span of 60 years. Uh, my entire legal career, and probably many of yours as well. The feel of argument is very different without them, but for their part, Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh have started to leave their own marks. They're both meticulously prepared at argument, and engaged questioners, and their early opinions have shown a strong commitment uh, to the text of the Constitution and to the text of statutes. And so I think they'll both be outstanding justices, and I look forward to watching them for many years to come. But I'd like to now turn to my principal topic for today, and it's one that has commanded a lot of my attention over the past few years. 
and that is the proliferation of nationwide injunctions. Since President Trump took office, federal district courts have issued 32 nationwide injunctions against the government. That's more than one a month. By comparison, during President Obama's first two years in office, district courts issued a total of two nationwide injunctions against the government, both of which were vacated by the Ninth Circuit. While the administration, this administration, appears to be a prime target of nationwide injunctions, they actually present a problem that extends far beyond any administration or any party. They're, in my view, a threat to core principles of separation of powers, to sound judicial administration, and to democratic accountability that con should concern all lawyers and all citizens, regardless of political party or views on policy. I think the clearest example illustrating the problem with nationwide injunctions involves litigation surrounding DACA. In 2012, President Obama announced the DACA program, which provided that the government would not remove people who came to the United States unlawfully as children and had lived here for a certain number of years without committing crimes. In 2014, the President announced a related policy called DAPA, with a P, that deferred removal actions against some parents of U.S. citizens or lawful permanent uh, residents. Texas and 25 other states sued the Obama administration contending that DAPA was unlawful, and a district court in Texas concluded that the challengers were likely to succeed on their claims. And that single district court judge then enjoined the government from, uh, from implementing the DAPA program with respect to anyone, anywhere in the nation. The Justice Department appealed that to the Fifth Circuit, which affirmed and the Supreme Court subsequently affirmed by an equally divided court shortly after Justice Scalia passed away. Now comes the current administration. After President Trump took office, the government announced that it would wind down the DACA program. Adv advocacy groups immediately filed suit in district courts, this time not in Texas, but in California and New York. Those district courts then promptly issued nationwide injunctions requiring the government to implement DACA everywhere, even though the executive branch, most of the states, the only court of appeals to have addressed the question, and half of the Supreme Court had determined that a materially indistinguishable policy was unlawful. So to make matters worse, Texas and other states then filed their own lawsuit, alleging that the government could not lawfully continue implementing DACA precisely what the courts in California and New York had ordered us to do. The district court in Texas, not surprisingly, agreed with the states. The court then had to decide whether to issue a competing nationwide injunction, ordering the government to stop DACA, which would have meant that injunctions, that we were facing injunctions simultaneously ordering us to both maintain DACA and to rescind DACA. Fortunately, the district court avoided that head-spinning result by declining to issue any injunction at that time. But the possibility that the United States could be subject to diametrically opposite conflicting injunctions before two different district courts in two different parts of the countries purporting to have nationwide effect, I think undermines, uh, under, uh, underscores the serious flaws with the very concept of nationwide injunctions. Meanwhile, it's notoriously difficult to challenge nationwide injunctions to get courts to actually review it, because the court generally only reviews the nationwide injunction aspect if it rules against you on the merits. If it rules for you on the merits, it never actually addresses whether the injunctive relief was uh, appropriate. So in DACA, for example, we've filed petitions for certiorari before the Supreme Court. We've tried to move the case expeditiously through the lower courts. But so far, we haven't had any definitive resolution from the Supreme Court on whether they're going to take the case. So it seems that the earliest it's going to be heard now is sometime in the fall with a decision, perhaps sometime by the middle or the end of next Supreme Court term. 
By that time, the executive branch will have spent almost an entire presidential term implementing a nationwide policy uh, 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 adopted by a prior administration that is entirely discretionary and that is likely unlawful. Put differently, the Trump administration will have spent three years under lower court orders to implement DACA after the Oma Obama administration spent two years under lower court orders not to implement DAPA. Uh, respectfully, that is simply not how our democratic system of government should work. So having outlined the problem, we talk a little bit about why it's such a problem. And of the many problems with nationwide injunctions, the first and most fundamental is that they conflict with core constitutional principles. Article three vests federal courts with the judicial power to decide cases or controversies. As the Supreme Court has long explained, cases or controversies are concrete disputes between parties. That limitation is fundamental to our system of separated powers. The framers knew the judiciary would be the least democratic branch of our government, but they also expected it to be the least dangerous branch, precisely because they limited courts' powers to deciding concrete disputes between parties, not supervising the other branches or issuing general pronouncements on the legality of their actions. Of particular importance here, Article III courts are not supposed to have authority to order relief to anyone beyond the parties to a case. The English system of equity, the foundation of our law of remedies, limited injunctive relief to parties. The Supreme Court has done the same. In a 19th century case, for example, the plaintiff sought an injunction for himself and anyone else affected by enforcement of a state statute that authorized confiscation of alcohol imported for private consumption. Although the Supreme Court decided that the statute was in fact unconstitutional, it specifically declined to award relief to anyone other than the plaintiff in that case. The court explained that it was, quote, possible that there may be others in, in like case with the plaintiff and that such persons may be numerous. But such a state of facts is too conjectural, the Supreme Court explained, to furnish a safe basis upon which a court of equity ought to grant an injunction. Because Article III courts can't grant relief to non-parties, they can't issue nationwide injunctions because the very definition of a nationwide injunction is a grant of relief to everyone affected by a policy of question in question, not just to the parties to the case. And so unsurprisingly, federal courts do not appear to have issued any nationwide injunctions during the first 175 years of the Republic. The first documented nationwide injunction was issued by the DC Circuit in 1963. The next one didn't come for another decade. And according to the Justice Department's best estimates, courts issued only 27 nationwide injunctions in all of the 20th century. Compare that to the 32 that we face in less than two years. Courts respected the constitutional limitations on the scope of injunctive relief, even at times when it would have been more convenient not to. For example, during the New Deal, the Supreme Court concluded that a number of significant federal statutes and executive actions violated the Constitution. Although those statutes and actions had national scope, the Supreme Court never once issued a nationwide injunction, and neither did the lower courts. To take just one example, lower courts issued more than 1,600 individual injunctions against the enforcement of a tax in the Agriculture Adjustment Act, but the government collected that very same tax from the more than 71,000 people who didn't challenge it. Another powerful example is the steel seizure case. President Truman's order seizing the steel mills during uh, the Korean War applied to steel mills across the nation. But only certain steel mills brought suit, led by Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company in Youngstown, Ohio. And the district court enjoined the enforcement of the seizure order only with respect to the plaintiffs in that case. 
when the Supreme Court affirmed the decision scope. Uh, the most dramatic example of this is the Affordable Care Act. When Florida and other states challenged the law in a Florida district court, the court there concluded that the individual mandate was unconstitutional and that the rest of the statute was inseverable from the mandate. But the court did not issue a nationwide injunction. In fact, it didn't issue any injunction at all. It simply granted declaratory relief to the plaintiffs and it stayed that relief pending appeal. The contrary approach taken by some district courts over the past two years rests not only on a departure from settled limitations of Article III, but also on a fundamental misunderstanding of the role of courts in our society. Courts issuing nationwide injunctions often describe themselves as striking down or invalidating a law. And although we probably all used terms like that as a shorthand, in fact, a court has no authority to strike down a law. A court has authority only to resolve a dispute between parties. The Supreme Court explained this almost a century ago in a case called Massachusetts against Mellon, where it said that when a court exercises its injunctive party, it enjoins, quote, not the execution of the statute, but the acts of the official, the statute notwithstanding. That fundamental principle flows from the equally fundamental principle that federal courts do not have roving commissions to oversee the general legality of the actions of the political branches, a principle that is simply irreconcilable with the concept of nationwide injunctions. In addition to their constitutional defects, nationwide injunctions also distort sound principles of judicial administration in numerous ways. Although there are many of them, I'm going to highlight four basic ones. First, nationwide injunctions are inconsistent with authorized mechanisms for aggregate litigation. Nationwide injunctions are sometimes justified on the grounds of uniformity. They ensure that everyone subject to the same policy will be subject to the same ruling. The problem with that reasoning is that Congress and the Federal Rules Committee have carefully designed other mechanisms to guarantee uniformity in aggregate litigation, and none of those mechanisms authorizes a nationwide injunction. The leading example is, of course, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 23. Under that rule, named plaintiffs can bring a class action on behalf of unnamed class members, sometimes even across the nation. But they can do so only if they meet a series of rigorously defined and frequently litigated procedural and substantive limitations, including demonstrating that they will adequately represent adequate absent class members, that absent class members receive notice of the action, and that absent class members have the opportunity to opt out. And significantly, members of the class who do not opt out are then legally bound by the district court's judgment, win or lose, and they're precluded, win or lose, from relit relitigating the same issue in a different district court. Nationwide injunctions don't include any of these procedural protections. They're thus an end run around the constitutionally approved mechanisms for aggregate litigation. Second, nationwide injunctions improperly expand the reach of individual district court judges. In creating a system of 93 judicial districts and 12 regional circuits, all under one Supreme Court, Congress set clear geographic limits on the scope of lower court decisions. As a general matter, Individual district court decisions are not binding on other judges, even other judges within the same district court. That structure has many virtues. It creates a system of checks and balances within the judiciary and it encourages what is sometimes called percolation, the process by which multiple lower courts address an issue before a higher court steps in to resolve it. When a district court judge issues a nationwide injunction, it short circuits that entire process. Because a nationwide injunction prevents the enforcement of executive action against anyone in the country, there's no practical incentive for either the government or private parties to litigate the question in other jurisdictions. 
That's because whatever the result of the litigation in those other jurisdictions, the policy still can't be implemented anywhere else in the country as long as one court has issued a nationwide injunction. That nationwide injunction therefore allows a single district court to effectively render irrelevant the decisions of every other district court in the country, and even the decisions of the courts of appeals uh, outside of the district court's own circuit. And nationwide injunctions allow district courts to wield that extraordinary power asymmetrically. When a district court denies a nationwide injunction, it doesn't affect any other case. But when a district court grants a nationwide injunction, it renders all other litigation on the issue irrelevant. That means that in order to prevail, the government has to run the table. We have to win every case, whereas our opponents, our opponents have to win just one. A system built around such a one-way ratchet is illogical, and it has no basis in equity. The stakes, moreover, are high. District courts over the past two years have issued nationwide injunctions against significant executive branch policy initiatives affecting public safety, foreign policy, and national security, including policies like the rescission of the DACA program, the president's travel proclamation in three different forms, the transgender military service policy, and numerous immigration policies addressing the crisis at our southern border. In exercising nationwide control over policy in these core areas of executive authority, a district court judge can single-handedly freeze presidential action nationwide for months or even years. It's hard to think of anyone who wields that much short-term power beyond the President of the United States himself. Third, nationwide injunctions also invariably lead to forum shopping. It's not hard to notice that most of the nationwide injunctions issued against the executive branch over the past two years have come from district courts in California, New York, the District of Columbia, Maryland, and Hawaii, while most of the nationwide injunctions issued against the executive branch in the years before that came from district courts in Texas. I'm not here to question any judge's motivation or independence. As Justice Kavanaugh explained in his first opinion for the court, quote, it is not unheard of for one fair-minded adjudicator to think a decision is obvious in one direction, but for another fair-minded adjudicator to decide the matter the other way. But even assuming all good faith, the appearance of foreign sh forum shopping is, is inescapable and it is damaging to the ideal of an impartial judiciary. Finally, nationwide injunctions create unnecessary emergencies. When a district court imposes a nationwide injunction on a significant executive branch initiative, the Justice Department has little choice but to seek emergency relief from the Court of Appeals and or the Supreme Court. Nobody benefits from litigation in that posture, not the government, not the plaintiffs, and not the courts. But the alternative for the government is often to wait months or years for appeals in the certiorari process to run its ordinary course. As most people who have worked in government can appreciate, allowing a significant presidential initiative to sit on ice for much of a presidential term on the order of a single district court judge is often not a realistic option. In fact, it's not an option that any president has ever before had to consider with any frequency until the last two years. And I would submit that for the good of the country and for the good of the courts, it's not an option that any future president of any party should have to face going forward. District courts instead should return to the principles that guided injunctive relief for almost all of our nation's history and limit their relief to the parties before the case. Now, I've spent a lot of time complaining and I don't mean to complain. I, I actually have a fantastic job and in some respects this whole problem of nationwide injunctions has made the job even more interesting because it is uh, 
thrust us into the middle of a lot of fights that we ordinarily wouldn't get into in the Solicitor General's office until year two or three of an administration. So let me just wrap up really quickly on a positive note. I, I know that we've got um, some federal prosecutors in the room, we've got law clerks, we've got judges, and so I want to say something that I say whenever I talk to government lawyers around the country. Folks like me, I come into the government every decade or so. I do a couple of years of public service and then I move on and do other things. But one of the things that I love most about this job is that I get to stand by shoulder to shoulder with people who haven't decided to devote a couple of years to public service, but people who have decided to devote their entire careers to public service, often at significant cost to themselves and to their families. So really, notwithstanding all of the, the, the stress and all of the problems that come along with the job, the greatest part about it is that I get to stand shoulder to shoulder with these fantastic men and women, public servants, dedicated public servants, protecting and defending the statutes, the laws, and the Constitution of the United States. And it's to them uh, that I am truly grateful for making the job such an amazing job to have. Uh, Thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I don't know if we have a question and answer session, but I'm happy to answer questions if people have them. There we go. Um, so you mentioned briefly the distinction between courts of law and courts of equity, which is something Judge Batchelder also referenced from the anti-federalists in her opening. And I'm wondering, um, obviously, the decision to combine the courts um, for the federal system um, was made on purpose. But it seems like it, it keeps coming up that maybe there have been some unintended consequences from that. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, and if uh, there's ever a chance of disentangling those? <laughs> I, I don't know that there's any serious chance of disentangling them at this point in, in, in our history, but I don't think the combination was meant to uh, uh, lead to an expansion of the court's uh, equitable powers, and I think that's reflected in the fact that really nationwide injunctions have until very, very recently continued to be the rare exception uh, to the rule. We didn't have them for most of our country's history. We only had a few of them through the uh, 20th century, and now we seem to have an avalanche of them. So uh, I, I, I take uh, uh, Judge Batchelter's point about the combination of law and equity. I don't think that that's what's driving this particular problem that we're seeing today, though. So isn't the solution for the president just to uh, disregard these district statewide rulings and make the Supreme Court make a decision? <laughs> ne next, next question. <laughs> so I think my question is along the same lines, but maybe it's <laughs> one that you can answer. So you mentioned that the first nationwide injunction occurred in 1963. Cooper versus Aaron was decided in 1958. Cooper versus Aaron was where the Supreme Court, through a um, inarticulated premise, so an enthymeme, came to the conclusion that the Supreme Court's interpretations of the Constitution had the same force in all people who swear an oath to the Constitution as the written Constitution itself. And so chronologically, there's, there, I wonder if there's a potential relationship. And then also I'm wondering, when, you, when, when, that, when that conclusion is followed, what the Supreme Court was saying is that its decision in a case isn't binding just on the parties before the case, which is what you're arguing here, and which, with, with which I agree, but that the star decisis effect of that Supreme Court opinion is binding on every lower court judge, every lower court federal judge, every lower court state judge, and all state officials. And so I wonder, do you see a relationship between Cooper versus Aaron's capacious, to put it nicely, interpretation of the Supreme Court's own interpretive power and nationwide injunctions. Sure, uh, I'm not deeply familiar with Cooper versus Aaron, so I, I'm not gonna answer on that level of detail, but the general point 
is that uh, the, 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 you do still have to face the stare decisis effect of a Supreme Court decision, and nobody's questioning that. That's essentially, I think, what drove the president's actions after the steel seizure case. Uh, the Supreme Court does have the authority to establish principles of law that will then govern all lower courts and all litigants when they appear before those lower courts. So uh, to answer the prior question, which I kind of uh, joked off, you know, the president, if he doesn't follow a Supreme Court decision, is basically going to be facing injunction after injunction after injunction in every single district court case. So understandably, it makes sense that once the Supreme Court has ruled, uh, everybody else falls into line because everyone knows that every other court in the country is going to be bound by that decision when the same issue comes up. The real problem with nationwide injunctions is not when you look at it from the top down, but when you look at it from the bottom up, because that's where they have the most pernicious effects. It's pretty uncontroversial that the Supreme Court gets to say what the, uh, what the Constitution and the statutes mean for uh, purposes of the entire country. It is quite controversial to say that uh, one of the something like 500 or so different district court judges in the country get to say what the Constitution and the statutes mean for the entire country. But that's essentially the effect of a nationwide injunction. Uh, very sympathetic to your argument on the structural side, but it, it seems as though some of the examples that you use, the logic, and the, even the nomenclature nas nationwide injunctions all imply that you feel the same on the rights side, and so I'm curious if you could address how far your argument goes. In other words, if um, Congress passed a law prohibiting us from using the word red tomorrow and I were to go into court, I would be asking for injunctive relief that a court enjoin the correct agency from enforcing um, that prohibition or from punishing or imprisoning somebody. So if I, if I gain that injunction, that is by, by nature a nationwide in, injunction in that a court is restraining the government from punishing somebody who uses the word red. So is that the type of nationwide injunction that you also impose? Because you, one of your examples, or maybe, maybe several, implied that you may have a problem with facial invalidation of laws and think that only as applied cases should be brought as well. Yeah, you know, if you actually look at the, the, those types of First Amendment cases where you're challenging a statute that prohibits somebody from saying something that is arguably protected by the First Amendment, typically the courts aren't issuing nationwide injunctions, and I think, I think they almost never are. What they're typically doing is announcing that the law is facially unconstitutional and then issuing an injunction against the for enforcement of that law as against the individual party to a case. So I don't, I don't think that the issue is any different in kind when you're dealing with that type of statute than when you're dealing with the types of cases that have become much more frequent in the last couple of years. And I admitted the fact that they came out of the civil division when Judge, Judge Riedler was running it. Sure. So um, it, this, this is one of the less well-known aspects of the job. But one of the problems that the government faces when you've got 93 U.S. attorney's mm -hmm. office, offices across the country litigating cases in hundreds of different courts is how do you attempt to maintain some kind of consistency on the part of uh, the litigation positions that the United States is taking in different cases in different U.S. attorney's offices. And the principal way that we do that is that we say that whenever the government is the appellant, that is, whenever the government loses a case and wants to take an appeal, that appeal has to be approved by the Solicitor General. Now, you know, it's, it's not perfect because uh, that means that we don't have any centralized review of uh, the initiation of cases in the first place 
or if a case gets initiated in the first place and then the United States prevails in the district court, there's no uniform review over whether the United States should take, should uh, defend the appeal. So if the government wins and it defends its appeal successfully in the Court of Appeals, the first time you'll have that kind of centralized review is when it's up in our office uh, and, and we're looking at an opposition to a certiorari petition. And so I think if you look across uh, recent history and you look at some of the more lopsided losses that the United States has faced in the Supreme Court, often in white collar criminal cases where they faced uh, a series of 7, 2, 8, 8, 1, and 9, 0 losses, if you actually look at those cases, a lot of times what you're going to see is it was a case that was initiated by um, an AUSA somewhere in the country. He, success he or she successfully defended his, uh, his or her win on appeal. And so at that point, the government had no choice but either to confess error or to continue defending in the Supreme Court. So that's the basic way that we try to maintain uniformity. What Judge Riedler was referring to was what is the process for making decisions on what position we're going to take or authorize. And it really is um, an extraordinary uh, and comprehensive process that involves every part of the government that has a direct uh, stake in the outcome of case. So say um, the, uh, some EPA regulation is challenged and uh, a district court invalidates it and the United States is deciding um, whether or not to take an appeal from that invalidation. Uh, it doesn't just, they don't just send to me the district court opinion and ask uh, Solicitor General, can we appeal this case? Instead, you'll have uh, 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 the, the views of the Environmental Protection Agency represented, the views of the uh, Environmental Natural Resources Division represented, the views of the Civil Division represented if they're involved in the case as well. That entire packet of materials will come to my office where one of my assistants uh, will review it and draft a detailed me memorandum summarizing everything and making a recommendation. On top of that, one of my deputies will review, review everything and then make his own recommendation. To the extent there are disagreements within the government, uh, if people have different recommendations, we'll bring everybody into the room and sometimes we have meetings with 20, 30 lawyers in the room and we'll try to hash out any disagreements to see if we can arrive at a position that uh, satisfies everybody's interests or at the very least that everyone can live with um, and that also reflects what we think to be a sound view of the law. So uh, although I'm kind of, I kind of sit at the top of that process uh, to say that I'm the one that ultimately, you know, I am the one that ultimately makes the decision, but it's a decision that is informed by an extraordinarily complicated process that involves a lot of different lawyers, uh, and, and so it's a well-informed process. So if there's nothing else, we can wrap up. Thank you, everybody.